point is on the origin. Yeah. Um, because don't direct variation equation start at zero zero. Well, let's not say start because that this could, could be misleading. It goes forever. It doesn't end or start anywhere. So it goes on forever in both directions. But it does go through the origin. They all go through the origin. If we remember that all direct variation equations, they look like this. That's how direct variation equations look. But that looks kind of like this. Right? Only it's the letter A instead of the letter M. That doesn't really matter. It's still a number times x. And this is plus B, meaning that there might be some non-zero number here. Uh, this also has a plus B. It's just that it's plus 0. The B is always 0. What does the B represent in this slope-intercept form? Go to graph y equals mx plus b. What is the b as you're graphing it? Tell these what y is? Sort of. Yeah? It's the intercept. The y intercept. So that's the, the y is sort of. Yes, it's the y intercept. It's where your graph is going to intercept the y axis. And since all direct variation equations have a zero right here, they don't have a, a b other than zero. And the y-intercept must be zero. All direct variation equations go through the origin. So um, the y-intercept of all direct variation graphs. But here we come to the second point. This is where Mira makes a mistake. Why is your second point incorrect? Yeah. Can she done the non of the y's instead of the y's over the She just flipped it around. So she did uh, down three into the right one. That would be negative three over one. She just kept the common mistake when her maybe rushing through things. Should be rise uh, one slow uh, rise one run three. Um, one of them being negative. So down one and to the right three would do the trick. So uh, flipped. This guy Carlton has worked this out correctly. He's determined that yes, this is direct variation. Now, however you might have done this, decided whether or not this is direct variation, what Carlton has done is divided y by x. In every case, he takes the y and divides it by x. Okay? And at the end, after he gets a 5 for all those, he decides that means that it is direct variation. Um, why is that? Why is dividing y by x proof? Or the fact that when you divide y by x, you always get 5. Why is that proof that it's direct variation? Two or three logical steps to say, well, this is why. If you divide y by x, you get the same thing every time. That must be this direct variation. Okay. said there's maybe a couple, two or three steps to get from the fact that, it, that, that we have this uh, set of data uh, and to conclude that dividing y by x and getting 5 every time gives you direct variation. But who wants to chip away at it? Say something. Why is what Carlson did there prove that it's direct variation? Because they all equal five, that is very important. 
Okay, if, it were, if one of them was to equal seven, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. You gotta get five every time. Okay. But y divide y by x? Why not divide x by y? In this case, you do. Um, yeah, in this case, you do. But I mean, why, why divide y by x? Why not add y to x or subtract x from y? Why are you dividing y by x? Let's start with what does it mean for, for it to be direct variation? What does it mean for y to vary directly with x? Just waiting for somebody else to answer. Maybe it's time for you to participate because it doesn't seem to be working. So again, the question is, what does it mean to say y varies directly with x? There's a meaning to saying that. What does it mean? Y equals x. It's exactly what it means. Y equals a. y varies directly with x means that as x changes, you multiply it by a, whatever a is, and that's what causes y to change. As x gets bigger, y is going to get bigger as well. Okay. <coughs> okay, so direct variation, that's what it means. Well, if y equals a times x, can we solve this for a? Can we get a by itself? The answer is yes. Now the question is how? Connor? Um, whatever the answer is, you put it in for A, and you leave by B1. So you put 5 for A, and solve. So you look at this, and you know that A is 5? Yeah. How do you know that? Because they all equal up to 5. Because what? Because they all equal 5. Because they all equal 5. Okay. Um, why, why y divided by x? Why does y divided by x give us a? What about x divided by y? Does that, does that give us a? Why are we doing it that way? Yeah, um, a is your constant. A is the constant. So it could be the constant number, which is what a Could be. So you're saying that this could be a? Or is it a? That is a. It is a. Constant. If it's direct variation, then this would have to be a constant, right? It could be different for each case. Um, so that's true. It does have to be the same for every one of them. Why, why is dividing y by x? Why does that give us a? What about x divided by y? Would that give us a? Probably not, since y divided by x does give us a. Jared? Um, I don't know. Kind of like
times what? One times what? Times what? Right? You multiply. What do you multiply one by? To get five, and then to multiply this by the same thing to get ten, and the same thing to get fifteen, to get twenty, and to get thirty. Okay. So you can see that that's five. So, well, six times what equals thirty? That's that's say the same thing as thirty divided by six. Remember in second or third grade, or I don't know exactly when you learned division, but you learned it as like reverse reverse multiplication. Thirty divided by six means six times what? Times what equals thirty? Okay. That was what division meant. That's what it means. Six times what equals thirty? So because we know that we're taking x and we're trying to multiply it by the something, by a, to get y, then dividing y by x would give us a. If we divide both sides by x here, cancel out that x, y over x is a, if we solve that equation for a. So we're supposed to be able to take x times something to get y, so if we take y divided by x, that should tell us what that thing is, that constant is, that constant of variation. So Lydia's found the direct variation equation correctly. Here's her work. So the first thing that Lydia does is to write y equals a times x. Why is that the first thing that she does, do you think? Fine. Is that the direct variation equation? Because that's what a direct variation equation needs to look like. So just to make sure everything is the way it ought to be, she just writes it down as a reminder, OK? Um, in the end, she needs to figure out what A is. She's, she needs a number to be there for A. Yeah, I think we've said that already today. Okay, but she doesn't know what A is. She just knows that Y and X vary directly. And she knows that X equals negative 6 when Y equals 15. So if X can be multiplied by a number to get Y, well, we can just take X, multiply it by some number that we don't know yet, and say that we get 15. So we divide both sides by negative 6 so that we can get this by itself, the thing that we're trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out what a is. So we divide both sides by negative 6. We simplify a is negative 5 halves, and we put that back into that original to give us the, the equation, y equals negative 5 halves x. Questions on the, the quiz or the homework? So we're supposed to write the equation of this line. So first we need to write the equation of this direct variation. Uh, that looks like this, y equals ax. <coughs> which is like y equals mx plus b. Okay, except for now we're calling m a, but they do the same thing, right? So here, what is m in this equation? Ooh. The slope, very good. And that would be, as we said before, the y-intercept. So also, this is 0. 0 is always the y-intercept for direct variation. And this is still the slope. It's just called a instead of m. It doesn't really matter what letter you use. It still serves the same purpose. So we don't really need to worry about that. That's just 0. It's always 0. Slope. What's the slope of this line? Derek? Two over negative two. Two over negative 
to start uh, what, here. You go up two and to the left two. We can simplify that. Two divided by negative two is negative one. And we don't have to write a one, we can just write negative x. And then it says figure out what y is when x is eight. So what is y when x is eight? Negative eight. Okay. Uh, and then 24, the other one. Again, we just need y equals the slope times x. What's the slope of this one? Really? 5 over 4. 5 over 4. We go up 5 and over 4 to get to this point. We know that there's a point at the origin. That's the way all direct variation equations are. Move up 5 and over 4. There's our slope. Okay. And find out what y is when x is 8. If y varies directly with x, if this is direct variation, then what does that mean? Just a hint, we already answered this question. What does it mean if I say y varies directly with x? y equals ax. That means to find y, you can always take x and multiply it by whatever the number is. You should always be able to take x and multiply it by something to get y. What can you multiply 2 by to get 1? Huh? 25. 25 to 45? Okay. Multiply 2 by 0.5, you get 1. 4 by 0.5, you get 2. And 8 times 0.5, is that 4? 16 times 0.5? No, that's not. 16 times 0.5 is 8, not 6. Okay, so. Um, question was stated, a student says that direct variation equation can be used to model the data in the table explained why the student is mistaken. You could say y equals one half x for this x and this x and this x, but it does not work for this x. It does not give you that y value, okay? Now you could multiply 16 times some number to get six, but it needs to be the same number you use for all the other x's. Okay? So there's not one equation of this form that works. That one doesn't work, and if we use the number that you multiply 16 by to get six, it wouldn't work for the other three. the amount of vacation in hours an employee earns varies directly with the amount of time t in weeks he or she has worked. Okay, so the amount of vacation time, which I think they give us a variable to use, yeah, they say that's v, um, with uh, weeks
time they've been at the job in weeks. So vacation time varies directly with the time you've been at your job. Vacation time varies directly with what's that? V equals T. V equals T. V equals A times T. So to to figure out how much vacation time you've earned, you should be able to just take the time you've been at the job and multiply it by some number, be a fraction. That's what we should be able to do. Um, an employee who works two weeks earns three hours of vacation time. Okay, let's, so this is like X, this is like Y. So say you've been at this job for two weeks. How many hours of vacation time are you allowed to take? What's that? Three hours. Three hours. Mm -hmm. If you've been at this job for four weeks, how much vacation time do you have? Six hours. If you're at this job for six weeks, how much vacation time do you have? What, nine? say, okay, for every two weeks, I get three hours. Um, so I should be able to take my time at the job and multiply it by some number to get the number of hours. What do I multiply two by to get three? What's that? Three over two. Three over two. Or, as we've talked about before, if this is x and this is y, if this is your input and this is your output, you should be able to take the output Divide it by the input and get A. 3 divided by 2, 6 divided by 4 simplifies 3 over 2, it simplifies by, to 3 over 2. If you look at it this way, if B is equal to AT, then A should be equal to V over T. If we solve this for A by dividing both sides by T, we should get A equals V over T. So if you take V divided by T, you should get A equals T. So the equation should be vacation time is 3 halves uh, the time you've been at the job time is in weeks and the uh, vacation time is in hours. Okay. Um, right variation equation that relates T and V, we did that just now. How many hours of vacation time does an employer earn in eight weeks? Eight weeks. Right there. V equals three halves times eight. Say V varies directly with T, we're saying V is equal to some constant times T. That wording is on some, some standardized tests. It's uh, a lot of times on um, the AP calculus test. We need to be familiar with just a specific vocabulary. This is not a complicated equation. You just need to remember that it is the definition. This kind of relationship is the definition of what we call direct variation. If y and x vary directly, then uh, the output is equal to a constant times the input. Other questions? Yeah. So the third of the graph is one. So and the y-intercept is always zero. So the only thing left in this equation is the sum. Five? No. That makes it easy. Don't do 25. <laughs> this is 4, negative 3. We just need to slope. So negative 3 fourths times x. Plus 0. The y-intercept is always 0.
has an input and only one output. Good. We'll just state it this way for every input, uh, only one output. Does that make sense? Every input, only one output. Yes. Okay. Which, I put, I put this other dot up here, which would imply necessarily that a function is a thing that uh, turns input into output. Now, this part is pretty much assumed every time. We usually don't have functions that give us more than one output, right? In your experience, you put in a, a number for x, and you get out y. Like you multiply x by 2, and you add 7, or whatever. Only one thing can happen there. Okay. Uh, so, let's we'll just say, this is important. It's necessary for it to be a function, and I do want to specify that every time we talk about a function. But it is pretty much assumed. There's not many relations, things to turn input into output, that give you more than one, or less than one, output. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this for very long. This is not the focus of our lesson today. But if we uh, I keep coming back to the definition of a function, it's so important. And it makes your life so much easier if you can trust me and believe that I know what I'm talking about and say, uh, if you can boil down a function to a thing that turns input into output, you put something in and something comes out, and we can talk about it in those terms, in terms of input, output, domain, and range, then your life is just going to be so much easier. It makes graphs make more sense. It makes functions make more sense. If we can talk about something goes in, something comes out. Now we are going to talk about uh, something that's very pertinent to functions, and that's function notation. You can see it's underlined over there, function notation. Um, before I tell you what function notation is and why we are even bothering to learn it, um, by the way, the reason we're learning is purely mathematical. You use this very often in your real everyday life. Okay? Um, the reason why we're learning it is our mathematical practical reasons. First, we've defined a function, and remember it's a thing that has something that goes in and something that comes out, right? Um, with just that little bit of reminder. Can someone give me an example of a function? We've been using them for eons, so no. yeah. No? no? Been using them for a long time. Like, we do functions all the time. So be, given a, being able to give me an example of one, it's not too tough. It's just Realizing what we've been using, they're called functions. Say you put something in, something comes out. If you have an example of that, that's a function. Go for it. Huh? Just x over y. Do you want? X over y. <coughs> x over y is close to being a function. Only, where do you put things in? Where does the input go? Equals. You need an equal sign, right? We just need it to be equal to something. X equals y. X equals y. Okay, that's a function. Let's we can take this one. We're gonna, we're gonna get rid of this one because we're gonna we're gonna kind of standardize it. But if we said x over y equals five, now we have a function. Right? You put an x, and really y is your output. We could go the other way, y is your input, x is your output, it doesn't really matter. It's just the standard is X is, is the input and Y is the output. To turn this into more of a regular looking uh, function, we'll get Y by itself, okay? So I'm gonna multiply both sides by Y. That cancels out that Y over there. This is X on this side, five Y. Then we'll divide by five. So Y equals, let's say, one fifth X. Uh, now we'll get rid of all this. So 
So now we have a. Somebody give me another example of a function. So x equals y. There's another function. Another example of a function. B is data as you want to be. As long as it has input, but the ability to turn input into output. One fourth equals four is not true. One fourth doesn't equal four. And it doesn't have the ability to do anything. It just sits there being false. One fourth equals four. Right? There's no input. There's no output. It's just a perpetually false statement. true statement, but it's not false, but is it a function? No. Why? What does the, the first thing a function needs to be able to do? Give an output, right? Give you an output for a given input. So there needs to be a way to put a number into the function and then, and then get a result out of that. So 2 times 5 is 10, that's true, but it's not a function, it's just a true statement. Functions like instructions. Take this number, do this to it, then do this to it, and then do this last step, and then you'll have the result. X times two equals y. X times two equals y. I'm just going to say it a little bit differently. Y equals two x. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you said. Even y. Yeah. Three x. Good. That's also. A <laughs> All right, I'm not crazy. Let's get crazy. Y equals 4x. Okay, it's not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> y equals 14x. Okay, that's a little more crazy than 4x. <laughs> okay, so now you're, you're telling me basically uh, take x, double it, that's y. Take x, triple it, that's y. Take x and multiply by 14, that's y. Could we do something after we multiply by x? Divide. Like an extra step? I like it. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this one out. Y equals 36x minus 2. Look, there's a, now there's an extra step we subtract 2, Stephen. Uh, y equals 1 half x plus 3. Y equals 1 half x plus 3. I'm gonna take this one out. Y equals 1 half x plus 3. Katie? Y equals 14x divided by 2. 14x, I'll just take this, divide it by 2. Now really that would be y equals 7x. Right, if I multiply it by 14 and then divide by 2, it would be the same as multiply by 7. Uh, is there good? I'm really, I'm excited to hear just the crazy, crazy function. Yeah, Ethan? Okay. Y equals 4x minus 3. Divide by four. Like that? Oh, oh snap, yeah. Okay, there's a function as well. Yeah. Connor? <laughs> what if you put something on y side, like y plus three equals x minus four? Equals x what? Minus four. Let me tell you why. First, I'll do this. We can do that. That is absolutely a function. That's that's a perfect example of a function. Okay. The reason why we don't write that as a as a habit is we like to have our output be by itself over there. We'd like to know what to do with our input, and then when we're done, just have that be it. Have that be the output. With this one, if I put in like the number one in for x. And then I'll subtract 4. Okay, so 1 minus 4 is negative 3. Okay, now I have to figure out what y would be so that when I add 3, I get negative 3. You see what I'm saying? I want to be done when the right side is all compiled. Okay? 
So if instead of y plus 3 equals x minus 4, if we get y by itself and subtract 3 on both sides, y equals x minus 7. Why don't we just write it as x minus 7, and that'll do all the work all at once, and then we'll know what y is supposed to be. Okay. That's why. Okay. I like this crazy function right here. It's great. Okay, we can move it, uh, we'll move it up there. I don't want to get too many examples. We're going to work with these a bit. Okay, if, does anybody feel like they can top the craziness of Ethan's function? Four. Oh. Here. Y equals 4x minus 3 plus 2 divided by 8. Oh, y equals 4x plus 3 divided by 2. Oh, well, you forgot the subtraction. Oh, wait, what, did I, what was I supposed to do? Plus 3. Plus 3. Minus 2. Minus 2. Divided by 8. Divided by 8. Yeah, it's clear. That's total. Well, why don't I just say, <laughs> why don't I just say y equals 4x plus 1 over 8. <laughs> right? Same thing. Just combine 3 minus 2 into 1. Good. Which is a similar craziness. I would say it's of equal craziness to Ethan's function. I thought this was crazy. Y equals... 26x minus square root of um, 40 okay. divided by 2. Divided by 2? Okay, that, that is a slightly higher craziness than you think. I mean, I, I, it could get really crazy, and we could do even more with x before we even multiply it, like y equals 5. But before we multiply it by 5, let's square 5x squared plus 2x to the third plus the square root of x uh, <laughs> plus 5, whatever. We can do anything that we want. We put in a, fun, uh, uh, a number for x, we do some mathy stuff to it, and there's our output. There's y. Okay? These are all functions. We're getting the idea. Input and output. Can you put something into that function? Yes. And then you get something out? Yes. So every input, is there only one output? Yes. Um, just one quick thing before we move on. I want to show you a, a, a function, a thing that, that will give you two outputs, and therefore is not a function. What we call a relation. It turns the inputs into outputs, but it actually gives you two outputs a lot of times. Just so you know that there's there are things out there that violate that second part of the function definition. Okay. So y equals the square root of x. So you take the square root of whatever number you put in for x. So let's say we put 9 in here. Okay. So we're going to take the square root of 9. How do we know we found the square root of 9? What's, what, how do we test it and figure out that it is the square root of 9? How do you know 3 is the, the square root of 9? Plus 2 times 3 is 9. Okay, so the square root of a number is, a, is some other number that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you the original. Nine times, the square root of 9 is 3 because 3 times 3 is 9. Okay? So it looks like the output is 3. You put in 9, you get out 3. But is there another number that you can multiply by itself and get 9? Gives you a positive nine. Is there a number that exists that does that? Negative three. Did you say that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. So you said that you I spoke up, up and I heard you. Okay. Y equals y equals three, or y equals negative three. Right. Here's our input x and our output y. There's two outputs. Okay. So is this a function? No. No, it's not a function. Okay. Because we get two outputs. We need one output for every input. Just a quick example of, of a counter, counter function, a function that's not a function. And those are called relations. In general, these things that turn input into output are a relation. It relates a number to another number. OK. So there's this thing called function notation that I still haven't told you what it is exactly. I'm going to help you understand why we use it. Okay. 
Well, up there, how many functions do we have? Five. Six. Five. <laughs> Five functions. Okay. Now, if I wanted to talk about one of those functions and distinguish it from another function, that's going to be kind of hard. Okay. Let's take this for example. There's five people in this row, and if I want to talk about one of them uh, with Tiger, let's say Tiger, and then what, how would I tell him who I'm talking about? Tiger. Tiger. Well, I talk to Tiger and say, Tiger, I'm going to talk to you about one of these five people, and then I say what? Tiger. Yeah, about one of you. So how am I going to distinguish one person from the other four? You use your hand. Exactly. Right now, okay, so you said hair color? Yeah. Now, this is an analogy, of course. I could use their hair color. There, now, there's, there's four brown heads in here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so that would be, that'd be kind of hard, maybe what they're wearing, okay, the pink one, and the gray, and the black, and the one with the green, and then the lighter gray, okay, so that's the one we request. But we, we use names because it's the, probably the easiest way to identify a person, and a name would be nice for these functions. Right now I could do something analogous to hair color, like uh, that one with a 36 in it, okay, okay so that, that has a 36 in it, but if I said... Uh, the one with a, a two in it. Well, this one has a two, this one has a two, this one also has a two, it's just in the denominator. Which one do you mean exactly? Right. So function notation, the first thing about it is that it gives these functions a name, okay? The kinds of names we give functions are single letters. The most natural one, since it's a function, would be f, okay? We'll call this function f, and I'm gonna write this, and not worry about that quite yet, but this function's name is f. Okay, now this function's name right now it's y, just like this one. This one's called y, and this one's called y, just like these other three. We'll call this one something else, we'll call it g. We call this one h. We call this one k. We call this one q. m. Okay, so we give them all new names, not just y. Okay. Now the other side's exactly the same. Just gave them new names. So now, instead of saying the one with the two in it, I can say this is the one I really want you to look at is H. I say H. Look at H, and there you are. You're looking at it. It's the one in the middle, right? H of X. So, I'm going to talk about this one right here. So G, you're going to now address what is this all about, okay? Now, this does not mean G times X. Okay? The way we say this is G of X. Okay? Just like that would be F of X, H of X, K of X, M of X. We call it G because that's its name. And we say of X because it's a function of X. To say something is a function of x means if I change x, it'll change the output. x is the letter that we're using to represent the input. Okay. So it does not mean times x. So, let's quickly review. There's really just one point here so far. What is the first important thing about function notation? What? Nothing. Nothing is important? No, no. 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 Yes, it gives them specific names. So function notation gives functions names where they didn't have names before. They were just all y equals y equals y equals y equals. All the brown hair. They're all brown hair. All of them. Last one. <laughs> all right. So names. That's the first important thing. Uh, the next thing, and the, the reason why we have this parentheses x, is instead of saying, well, tell me what this function is worth if you plug in 2 for x. That's a big long sentence. Now with function notation, we can just write this. This means, tell me what you get as the output if x is 2. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's tell me what the output is when x is 2 in g of x.
Eden? Do you see it? What is it? Look at the wrong How do you know? You didn't even tell me what it was. I asked you. G so that you know which function I'm talking about. I put G, not F, not H, not K, not M, but G. So you know to use this function. Okay. And two, look, this, this was X. This, um, I told you before, this X right here is the input. That's the variable we're using to, you know, the place where we're going to put the input value, whatever that value is. Well, X has been replaced with two, so on the other side, X should get replaced with two. That's exactly what should happen. 36 times 2, 2 is now the number of the value of x, uh, minus 2, well that's 72, minus 2, that's 70. Doesn't make, it doesn't mean g times 2. Okay. I gotta reiterate that because I, I think even if I say it 100 times, still I'm gonna see it on your homework quizzes next time we have class. Okay. Unless you take special note you're paying attention, you're saying, it does not mean times 2, it doesn't mean that g times 2, it means the function g needs to have a 2 plugged in for x. Okay, let's see if this has taken hold, and I'll just write, uh, So what does it mean, f of 5? Did you say f times 5? No. 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 What, what does that mean? You're done. I don't sound like that. Hildy, what does it mean? Uh, it means that you replace x with 5. You replace x with 5? Where? Uh, in f. Where x is. Just stop talking. Right, in f. You're right. In f. Right? Not stop talking because you're bad, because you're just right already. In f, the function's called f, we want to replace x with 5. Okay, so replace x. x is the number you multiply by 4, and after that you subtract 3 divided by 4. Now write out x is 5, 20 minus 3 over 4, 17 over 4. Do you feel the compulsion to tell me what decimal this is? Or what do you do? Just 17 over 4 is just fine. Well, Okay. Really? That's where you leave it? 4.25 yeah. is also yeah. fine, yeah. but your addiction to decimals yeah. is quite concerning. One last time before I feel like you totally get this little part of what we're doing, not the whole thing. Number 13.
the function. If you know what that if you don't know what that means, you probably really pay attention or uh, I would say pay attention would be a good strategy. The value of the function, the value, a value is a number, okay? Um, the value that the function has is just the output, okay? The value of the function is the y value, or more specifically, because y is not always the thing that we use now that we use function notation, the output value. If you hear the value of the function, think, okay, that's not the number I'm putting in. That's not the value of the function. The value of the function is what comes out of the function. When I put something in for x and I do all the arithmetic, the value of the function is the output. say the value of the function is negative 2. The value of the function is negative 2. What am I saying there? X is negative 2. That's just what I got that saying. That's not what this is. That's not what this is. X is given a choice between input and output. Which one is X? Input. Typically, input. typically it is the input. Now we can, we could switch it around. We we could do all, you know, flip x and y around for some reason. Okay, but pretty standard, x is input. X to input. Say what? The answer is going to be negative two. The answer is going to be two. So what do you, what do you mean by the answer is going to be negative two? Okay, so can you, I'm going to put an equal sign here. Okay. Can you tell me what goes on the left side? Um, if you're trying to figure out what number that would be? Okay, good. That's a good sign that you're doing that. You said after, okay, go ahead. Okay, on that side is the number you're going to put in for x, and the number you put in for x has to equal, uh, Something, well, 9 times something minus 5, which will get you negative 2. Okay, I'm just going to take what you said right there. It's right. Yeah. 9 times something. Call it x. Let's call it x. Minus 5 will get you what? What will you do? It will get you negative 2. Negative 2. The value of the function is negative 2. That means that after we're done doing this, we get negative 2. So now all we have to do is figure out what that thing is going to be. We, you do redeem yourself. Now we solve for x. Solve for x, if you would, please. Uh, well, solve for x in that equation right there. The value of the function is negative 2. We know that we're going to get negative 2. Now we just figure out what was that input that gives us negative 2 as the output. Yeah. Algebra skills, not guessing and checking. We're going to balance both sides out until we cancel things until x is left by itself. That's the first thing we can do to get x by itself. Yeah. Add, five on both sides. Add 5 on both sides. Excellent. Negative 2 plus 5 is 3. And then divide by 9 on both sides. x equals 1 over 3. Now, 3 divided by 9 is the same as 1 over 3. So an input of one third, we've now figured out. Input of one third would give us, what would it give us? If we put one third in here? You would get negative two. You would get negative two, right? That's how we started this whole adventure. We said the output would be negative two. And we figured out what the input would have to be. Okay. Give that a try. Um, 
with number 16. They're telling us the function. And then they're saying, this other number, negative 9, they're saying that the value of the function is negative 9. Right? If you read the instructions, it says, uh, find the value of x so that the function has, to the value, the function has this value. Same. The function's going to have a value of negative 9. So then figure out what the x value would have to be. Okay, so in the instructions there it says, so that, that's the dot dot dot, so that the function has the given value. First of all, what's the given value? Negative nine. Negative nine is the given value, right? Given value is negative nine. What does it mean to say that the function has that value? Yeah. Yes, the output. Very specific, the output. Okay. Well, here is, here's what you do with the input. The output, or what you get, should be negative nine. Okay. We'll subtract 12, negative 21, divided by negative 7, we get 3. So to get an output of negative 9, we have to, what do we have to put into this function to get out negative 9? 3. We said, we, we, we said to this function, look function, you're going to have an output of negative 9, okay? And then it says, that's fine. And then we figure out that x would have to be 3 in order to get that output of negative 9. <coughs> uh, okay, I switched the concentrate on that function just like, forget everything else except for that function. That's it, right there. H of x equals negative seven x plus twelve. So should I kind of make a new problem? Okay. Bring that down over here. That's the only part that we're going to use. What we're going to do is graph it. We graph. Graph the function. If this seems like a new idea, it's not. Okay. If you need some help, look at section four point five. This is straight out of four point five. Only we're using function notation instead of y. I think people should listen to Derek. He's got some stuff to say. No, I don't. Okay, so we're going to graph this function h of x equals negative 7x plus 12. Okay. Well, if I took a look at section 4.5, I see that this is just mx plus b. <coughs> Same as y equals mx plus b. If we go back to the beginning of this discussion, we had all these functions y equals y equals y equals y equals y equals y is just the output. Right? And then we gave them all names m of x, h of x, or k of x, h of x, g of x, f of x. Okay? Those all also represent the output. y represents the output, f of x represents the output, h of x represents the output, g of x represents the output. So here, the output is found by doing this with the input. You can call this the h of x axis and this the x axis. It's like it used to be the y axis and the x axis. You can have the h of x axis. That just means the value of h at whatever x value, whatever that x value is. Okay. Well, that x value changes. We look at different x values in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Now, I hope we haven't forgotten that this x-axis is a given input, okay? So you go to that input, and then if you find a point on the graph, wherever that graph is at that x value, that's the output. Right? So the input, we go vertically to the output. Right? But a pretty quick way to do that, if we remember mx plus b, what is b? 12. Y-intercept. The y-intercept, and it is 12. So the y-intercept is 12. Okay, and what is M? Slope. The slope. 
and here the slope is negative 7. So we have a y-intercept of 12. Well, there's a y-intercept of 12. Slope of negative 7. So down, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and over 1. H of X or M of X or G of X or P of X or whatever. All that means is the output of the function. Just like Y means the output of the function, H of X means the output of the function. You can call this the H of X axis just like you can call it the Y axis. So for instance, for an input of one, for an input of one into this function, what's the output? What will you get out when you put in one? And how do you know that? Uh-huh. 12 minus 7 is 5. Or I can look at the graph and see that there's this point at 1, comma 5. That also tells me the same thing. And if I input 1, I get out 5. Okay. I'm not quite sure how you did that. I know you went down 7 when you were from 12, but yeah. how did you know to come out 1? Seven because the one. slope is oh, negative yeah. 7. Over one. If the slope is just a, a number and it's not a, it's not written as a fraction, you can always just put it over one. Um, work on the homework for the rest of the time.